Welcome, Sarah. Thank you so much for joining me. How are you doing today? Yeah, I'm pretty good, actually. Um, yeah, really privileged to be starting 2021 quite busy. Um, I think it's actually a great thing to have work at the moment, you know. Um, I think work is a wonderful way to remain engaged in a really good way while there's so much chaos going on and so much to process. So I feel very, very lucky from that point of view. But thank you yeah. for asking. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's good to hear. Um, I'm a big fan of your writing and I've been so enjoying your book, your new book, This One Wild and Precious Life. And I really needed this book. I didn't realise how much I did, but I really needed it. It's really addressing so many of the things that I'm thinking about and conversations that I'm having with people. Um, can you sort of share a bit about what the book's about and also a bit about the journey that you took to writing it? Because it wasn't that straightforward, it sounds like. Yeah, um, so it's almost like a part two to the book that came out in the UK, I think two years ago, called First We Make the Beast Beautiful, which was an inward journey that I went on to kind of understand anxiety and my bipolar and my obsessive compulsive disorder through a, a lens that was more useful and more productive and more joyful, so a philosophical and spiritual lens. And um, that was great. I had great conversations. It was a great healing tool. And um, I've always been involved in the climate movement. And so as I started to get lots of strength back and lots of joy in my life because I was connecting in a new way um, with everyone around me, because I'd not talked about this subject so openly before, um, I noticed that the anxiety and the angst and the dis-ease was manifesting in the outward world, the outside world, as opposed to an inward journey. I knew I needed to go on an outward journey. And I thought the times were really suggesting that that was a journey that all of humanity needed to go on. We'd been on this individualistic, downward slide neoliberalism had come to its zenith and and everything we were doing was individualistic and in fact as you'd know you know chloe in the book i actually talk about spiritualism and the self-help culture and how it can be really problematic because it's too insular it's too individualistic it's too me 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 focused um and so yeah, I figured that I needed to go outward and investigate this collective anxiety that was happening to talk about why we'd arri arrived where we were at and then to come up with a way, a path forward through it, through this complexity and what really is an overwhelm. An overwhelm that was making people descend into inaction, which is exactly what we do not need as the planet burns and um, we destroy it and we are threatened with pandemics and political fragmentation and so on. We need to be active, alive to it. We need the better discussion. So I think that probably answers your question. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, I wanted, I wanted to ask you about something you, you talk about in the beginning of the book. I'm going to read a little bit. You talk about something you call the itch. The planet is burning. Refugees cry out for our help. The gap between the haves and the have-nots has become a cruel chasm. And we? Yeah, well, we scroll and binge watch and buy stuff, which makes the itch worse. Can, can mm -hmm. you sort of describe a bit more about what, what this itch is? I think so many people could, just will hear that and think, actually, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I couldn't come up with a word that really summed up what we were feeling because it isn't quite anxiety. Anxiety is one of the ramifications of this other feeling it's kind of a cringe it's an it's a it's a fear mixed with anger because we want to blame someone for the scenario we're in right and then then it's with a guilt because we know we're complicit like it's not like it's a war where we can point our finger outwards and go that's caused the problem you know in this case we cause the problem and we know it and then, and then it's um, you know it's and then it's despair and grief as well because we are grieving, like the loss of biodiversity. Um, we are grieving the loss of animals that were in our picture books as children and are now on the extinct list. And we're also grieving the plans we had for our future. So especially 
in most places around the world, young people in particular, um, you know, their plans for finishing maybe school or university are on hold. Uh, their plans to maybe go off and do an internship or to travel, to do a gap year and travel are on hold, potentially never to be realised again. We don't know. And so there's grief. So it's all of these feelings and, of course, the worst part of it is the fact that we know we're complicit and we're doing nothing. And so I describe it as this itch, this really awkward sense that we're not living life right. We're not doing life right. And um, we need to change. And we are so overwhelmed. We don't know where to start. We've, we go numb. We go numb. Yeah. Mm, yeah, I relate to that feeling so much. It's almost like, I don't know whether you would call it like a cognitive dissonance of kind of putting something in the recycling bin and then thinking I shouldn't have bought that thing in the first place but then being sort of faced with pressures to live at this fast pace and feeling like we need to have convenience and and then thinking does it matter what I do and then exactly but yeah it does matter yeah and I'm caught up in this is there another framework to work to is the only solution communism and socialism where do I start where's fake news begin where does it end it's there is just so much to digest and um and the upshot is we often do go into numbness we go back to scrolling we go back to watching television we go back to um avoiding uh confrontation and discomfort and of course i talk about this in the book as well um added to all of this is a culture where we have been that's been geared towards cocooning ourselves from discomfort we run from it rather than seeing that discomfort is a sign a signal a very useful signal to say you need to change you know all right everyone let's regroup let's bring the whiteboard out and come up with a different way of going about things instead we just shut down and we we watch more tv and um you know it's a really interesting um phenomenon like we talk about technology um and you know it's this big problem well i actually say that technology only ever enables right it enables um And so the more interesting question is, well, what does it enable? It enables our, at the moment, our kind of worst tendencies as humans. It enables distraction and it enables us to shut down a cocoon and avoid discomfort. And um, I think it's something like 80 to 90% of all technology that's been produced in the last 30 years has been geared towards eliminating discomfort. So, you know, eliminating uncertainty as to when our pizza is going to arrive on, you know, via some delivery app because we can follow it. Um, it, You know, the discomfort of not getting something like we don't, gratification is rarely delayed. So we don't even get to test that resilience muscle. Um, So yeah, it's, it, and, and a big part of what I try to show in the book is the reasons why we are where we're at, because once we understand it actually lifts that burden, the really itchy part of it, which is that we are to blame and we alone must fix it. So once we understand where it's come from, that it's a systemic issue, then we can start to have a really useful, compassionate, fun, enlightening, joyful discussion about what we're going to do about it. And, we, and we're more likely to, um, to engage in action because we don't get too overwhelmed. I'm really, I'm really curious to know how you dealt with the feelings of kind of really focusing on this issue a lot and writing about it because the amount of research that you did and some of the things that you wrote about cli- the climate change I almost I mean I think you even say in the book you know I feel like I don't even want to write this down because it's so frightening um how did you mm-hmm. kind of deal with all that because the temptation I think for lots of us and, and the problem is that we just don't want to look at it and we just put it in a box and try not to think about it and watch Netflix instead. Yeah um, well to a certain extent once you actually really come face to face with the climate information the science you can't unsee it and it becomes more painful to try to ignore it than to face it and go right I want to do about it. It's more painful to bury my head in the sand than it is to roll my sleeves up and at least give give the situation my best shot. And look, I'm going to be really honest with you. This is a discussion I had with all of the climate scientists that I interviewed for the book. And I think I I interviewed around about a dozen 
uh, climate scientists, many of whom work on the IPCC report, which is the big report that we work to at the moment that says that we need to reduce temperature increase for, uh, to limit it to 1.5 degrees, um, no more than 1.5 degrees by 2050. And that's what, that's the Paris Agreement essentially. So um, pretty much all of them, in fact, I'd say all of them I spoke to essentially declared that they know they're going to die of climate change, not old age, but climate change. And um, I accept that reality myself. Um, you know, and it it breaks my heart every time, even I'm getting welled up now talking about it, not so much for myself because I've had time to process it. Um, I'm really upset. I get upset because I fear for humanity's ability to deal with this once they, once everybody has their penny drop moment. I'm seeing what's happening politically around the world. I'm seeing what's happening with COVID and the, as you say, the cognitive dissonance that goes on as we try to avoid the truth. And it's the, you know, what is it, the, the, the conspiracy theories in and around COVID not existing or we don't need to wear masks and and um, the conspiracy theories around the, the electoral um, rigging in the US and so on. We're, we're doing all the, the ridiculous things to avoid facing the really scary truth of where we're at um, in the world. And the same is with the climate crisis. We will deny that anything's going on, that our takeaway coffee cup that we use, we use maybe one or two a day, and then we just throw in the bin. We deny that we actually know what's going on there. That plastic won't break down for at least 400 years. That plastic is going into the ocean and it's then been ingested by fish. And we're all ingesting a credit size card or credit card sized chunk of plastic every year, including children. It is going into our systems and it's now been found in the umbilical cords of newborn children um, or the placenta. Um, so we know this. And we go to great lengths to avoid the pain of, of that reality. And so for me, yes, I've had to face that reality. I've had to face the grief I feel. Um, and I've made very big decisions um, go, going from that. But one thing I'll say, Chloe, is that also at the same time, my life has taken a pivot turn to the more meaningful from all of this. My life is richer than it has ever been in my 47 years on this planet. I don't, I mean, I've been riddled with anxiety and, and so on all my life, as long as I remember. Um, and I would say that the realization, the work that I've had to do to deal with where we're at in the world today, and, and coupled with that very necessarily, the action that, that, that I've forced myself into has seen me actually get rid of the bulk of my anxiety. I wake up every day with a vigour, a balance, a certainty about myself uh, that I've never had before. So that's what I try to convey in the book. Mm -hmm. So to answer your question, how do I process all of this, and this, this reality? Um, I faced it head on. I, I accepted it. I understood it. I made myself understand it. I found compassion for myself and those people around me because a big part of the issue is we get so angry. Why isn't my, why should I go to all this effort of recycling if my neighbor's not, you know, how come nobody's going to these protests? They whinge about climate change, but they're not going to do anything about it. Once I understood all of it, I found compassion. And then I realized I need to take all of that, my anger and the negative uh, emotions and drive it towards action and as I started to do that I started to feel empowered and then my life took on purpose and as Viktor Frankl said and I think Nietzsche said it you know I'm going to paraphrase them together um, you know when we have you know, when man has a when humans have a why we can endure any kind of how we can put up with a whole heap of stuff so long as we have purpose that is that is a, an absolute truth so yeah that I've turned it into a I've turned it into a positive yeah that's amazing I think that's such good advice for anyone to to whatever might be going on in their life or in the world to, to face up to things and and take action because 
um, yeah, one thing that I've really taken away from your work and a lot of things you post on Instagram is that, you know, so if we're kind of navel gazing constantly and looking inwards, we're just going to get, we're going to find more and more stuff to, to, to feel unhappy with. If we can take action out in the world, that can, you know, give us, as you said, that meaning and purpose that actually is, is something that's really healing for us inside as well. Um, mm-hmm. I did. I wanted to ask you about the conspiracy stuff because I, I remember you wrote something in the Guardian. I don't know if it was a few months ago about this, and I have found that a, a big chunk of people that I'm friends with on Facebook not my not my really close friends, but people I'm friends with on Facebook that I might have met on a yoga retreat or um, mm-hmm. at some kind of ceremony, they've gone down a very different path than they had in the past, um, believing that the world is controlled by satanist blood drinking democrats and uh yeah covid doesn't exist and masks are just the government trying to control us i found this really quite hard to deal with um it's kind of shaken my sense of who i thought my kind of people were um and i've noticed so many arguments online about this so much division um i wonder like how do you have you noticed that in your own life as well and how do you cope with that and how do you how do you sort of approach it absolutely um i live in bondi sydney australia it is the epicenter of the wellness sort of realm and green smoothie and yoga crew and when they're not here they're in bali or (laughs) or la but um obviously i'm not at the moment um so much but um yeah i mean this is the realm i've been in by my work with the I Quit Sugar business that I had. And um, I've noticed it myself and it's been really interesting. It's very much dividing the community. Um, and those who are, well, look, I'm, I don't want to actually wade into it too much. I think anyone listening is probably a little aware of it. Um, but I, again, I, I wrote the piece for The Guardian because I wanted to understand it better. I often go ahead and write books or articles or, you know, volunteer to go on some news panel show if it's about something where i know i need to go and investigate it anyway it gives me a sort of a a a forum to have to go and do it so with this one yeah i went and sort of researched some of the psychology and it's actually not that new that's the really interesting thing about it um throughout history during times of disruption and fear and uncertainty conspiracy theories come forth and we can understand why Um, And then, um, but in particular, um, there's been a sort of connection between the wellness and spiritual community and and conspiracy theorising. And I was trying to understand why, and I think it's because, and obviously I referred to a number of experts for the column that I wrote for The Guardian. Um, It's a lot of people in the wellness realm um, very legitimately uh, question various sciences so the food and pharmaceutical industries are rife with corruption um you know that's that's kind of we know this the sugar industry has all kinds of formulas for getting us to eat their foods and for paying governments to avoid certain policies being put into place and you know much like the tobacco industry and and now we've got the pharmaceutical industry so there's big pharma and then there's big food right and they're they're massive entities and i think the wellness community have done great work in questioning it and holding it to account because the government isn't so there's this sort of drive that comes from a really great place and then when something really uncertain comes about like a global pandemic it can throw everybody all of us right and we all want to clutch at certainty in different ways and we do it in in kind of we as humans we're not great with kind of dealing with disasters actually we are when we're presented with them face to face right we rise to the occasion incredibly well and i think there's countless examples during world war ii of that happening particularly in britain uh during the the london blitz i mean um britain rose to its best self it was its healthiest um it was its most charitable and it was its happiest Um, suicide levels dropped to virtually zero during the London Blitz. Now, during a time like this, where it's 
uncertain. We don't know who the enemy is. We don't know what's going on and we don't know who to trust. So during a war, you generally have a wartime leader that can very clearly point to the enemy. Winston Churchill did that particularly well. Um, whereas with this, we don't know who to trust. And so people start, their imaginations go. And the wellness industry have always felt they needed to question things and they continued that vigilante approach. And then you couple it with really a bunch of algorithms, you know, and so um, you, you get onto YouTube and you go down a rabbit hole. And for anyone interested in this subject, um, a really good podcast that will explain it better than we can probably discuss it here in a short time. It's a, quite an extensive podcast. It's done by the New York Times and it's called Rabbit Hole. And it's a really good, it's a little bit old now, but it does explain how all of this works. Um, and I, I developed a whole heap of compassion. Now, um, so you, you start looking at some of these YouTube videos and you are steered, handheld, almost forced down a funnel into a certain way of thinking. And if you're scared already and you're wanting to look for certainty, then, then these YouTube and um, Facebook algorithms will take you there. They'll take you to a, what feels like a safe place, a community where there's answers and at least outrage, you know, collective outrage. So, yeah, um, I'm certainly seeing it around me and I've had to find a way to understand it and have compassion for it because it has been very unsettling. How can these people who feel very reasonably and kindly and compassionately about this thing have this view of things over here? But they're feeling the same way about you and I, you know? And I have a phrase in, in my book, um, and sorry, it, it's a quote from Rumi. It's part of a poem and it's, you probably know it. It's out beyond ideas of wrongdoing and right doing, there is the field, I'll meet you there. And I think it's the most beautiful call to arms because essentially, I mean, it really does remind us that, you know, there is somewhere where we can meet, where we can actually come to a good place of understanding that's not about being right or wrong. And we're gonna have to do it on this topic because so much has interfered with our cognitive processes to land us with at, at, in such fragmentation. Mm, I'm definitely going to listen to that podcast. Do, do you listen to the Conspirituality podcast? Have you heard of that one? I know it, and I read quite a lot of their work when I was researching that Guardian piece, but no, I haven't listened to it. Um, you know what? It's, it's sometimes I actually have to be self-protective because I want to understand it to a certain extent, but I don't want to. And it's a bit how I read the news and absorb the news. I need to understand it. It's responsible. And if, you know, you probably remember this phrase again from my book, if you're spiritual, you must be political. It's non-negotiable. You know, Jesus and Gandhi was, were political you know, um, and so, yes, as part of my spiritual practice, I stay abreast of news and various thing, various podcasts, but I also have to be, we also have to create our own boundaries um, that to, to prevent us from maybe going down a rabbit hole, but also from, from getting um, bereft, you mm. know. We, we, we should protect ourselves from too much information. We should know what's going on, but we shouldn't punish ourselves with it. Yeah, yeah, I think it is about finding that balance. We don't want to completely disconnect from what's happening in the world, but equally, we don't want to be doom scrolling. I think doom scrolling was the year of the word, uh, word of the year, sorry, last year. Um, we don't want to yeah. be doing that, definitely not. No, no. Um, and, really and, and the thing that, well, sorry, I was just going to say, go ahead. I, think that, I think that's really important as well, is that, it's a little bit like what I used to say when I was talking about I quit sugar. Um, a lot of people were going, well, why isn't the government doing, you know, once they started to realise what was happening about food, being uh, it's sugar being put in food to keep their children addicted, etc. They were like, well, why isn't someone doing about this? And, and once you understand the government probably won't, um, then what you need to do is then uh, take control of things yourself. And so that's what we need to do as well with um, too much information, like this deluge and this doom scrolling. No one's going to come and save us from it. The, the horse has bolted. What we need to do is actually create our own boundaries, our own, and I, I refer to these things as sort of moral and ethical guardrails, and we used to have them institutionally 
recognised by uh, the church or governments or HR departments that would ensure we didn't work 24 seven. So that we used to have these wonderful institutions, I called them the umpires on the field that would, you know, wave a flag or blow a whistle when individualism went too far. We don't have those anymore. Capitalism, neoliberalism has wiped them off the field. Uh, we have no respect, even science, right, has been disregarded. Um, and, you know, intellectuals and academia, you know, we're anti-academia. And so we are now left to have to work those boundaries out ourselves. And so, yeah, we certainly do have to address our own doom scrolling. No one's going to come and save us from that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I wanted to ask you also about loneliness. I know you, you sort of touched on this in the book and I remember you doing a I think it was an Instagram live talking about it. I think it was in the first lockdown, kind of your own experience of that. Um, and as I was reading your book the other day, I was thinking, oh, I'm noticing like I'm actually feeling some loneliness as well. And, and sometimes we don't maybe notice that emotion. We might feel bad or we might feel sad, but not really know that it's that. Um, have you, yeah, can you, can you share a bit about, have you experienced that in the last year? And how do you, how do you deal with that? Yeah, um, it's again an exploration. I had to sort of really get to the nub of what our loneliness is about because we, we have more interactions with other humans than ever before, even during COVID, even during various lockdowns, right? Um, you know, we've just, we've got that deluge of interactions. But what we are often lacking is meaningful engagement, meaningful relationships, meaningful um, engage, uh, interactions. So, um what I think is the most painful kind of loneliness, whether you are in a relationship, whether you've got a big family around you or whether you live in your own, as, as I do. So I did I did only a six-week fairly intensive lockdown right at the beginning because Australia was really quick to jump on it and it prevented us actually from, I mean, we, I think we've got, I think we've got maybe a dozen cases in Australia of COVID at the moment. Um, we've even got down to zero cases. And then the only cases we're getting at the moment is from overseas travellers that are coming back into the country and then it sort of leaks out of the, the hotels where they're in quarantine. But um, so we did it quite early and it was really, it was hard because we, in a, in a crisis, we are programmed to go and hunt out or gather around other humans. That's what we do to survive. And so our primitive urge has been blocked, you know. Mm -hmm. um, now for people who've got kids and they're doing homeschooling, it's a completely different story. But again, I think there's a similar kind of loneliness that's being felt. And the loneliness is really, um, it's, a, it's a loneliness from meaningful engagement, but it's not just from others. It's also loneliness from a meaningful engagement with ourselves. There is so much, distraction going on in the world that we fail often to have a conversation with ourselves we fail to have moral discussion with ourselves discerning moral discussion and so even the practices that we used to have you know during throughout history have been wiped once more by neoliberal thinking and uh it's kind of considered you know, woo woo to, to do that. And then of course we've also we're also lacking meaningful a meaningful relationship or connection or engagement with the world, with nature and with meaning. So um, that's something that I address in the book that we have to reconnect. We need to find practices to reconnect in a meaningful way to others to ourselves and to the world. And it's really on the latter one that I really focus towards the end of the book because I feel that the salve to saving the planet and really the salve to saving humanity because the planet will survive. It will just kind of adjust and humans will be wiped out and it will keep moving on, right? Um, it will find new species to keep it, to keep the, the the, the balance, you know, going. Um, but the, the, I think the secret to giving our, having our best shot at it is to reconnect meaningfully with the world around us. We, our relationship with um, the patterns of nature have been severed. And so, and as a result, we've, we've lost touch with how much it means to us, how much 
planet means to us, how much biodiversity and equilibrium matters to us. And um, I sort of feel that, and I have this phrase on the back of the book, uh, it's the blurb that's been pulled out and it's along the lines of, um, humans will save what we love if we love it hard enough. Um, and so our challenge is to remind ourselves of how much we love nature. We need to get into it. We need to, to be in it. We need to be with it. And then we'll want to save it. We'll just do everything we can to save it. And so that's my stealth motivation of the book is to get people meaningfully connected with nature, with life, with life. Mm, yeah and and in in sort of various stories throughout the book you share about walks that you've done and I found myself really craving being able to kind of walk in nature and you can't it's not really you can't really do that so much in Bali it's there's rain there's torrential rain then it's 30 degrees too hot for an English person to walk in the day and then um, there aren't kind of pavements, so it's not like in a city, like in London, you walk around the streets of London or something, or in a park in London. And I was really craving that, and um, I'm sure people reading that will. Is that what you kind of wanted people to get a sense of, kind of strap on your your hiking boots and get out there? Yes. Yeah, so look, the the hiking motif um, kind of carries what's a pretty heavy, gnarly storyline, you know. So there's my personal story and. I actually share some fairly intimate grief that I go through in the three-year period of writing the book. And then there's the the freaking heavy shit of the world's coming to an end, you know, and um, there's political fragmentation. We're not getting anything right. You know, what are we going to do? So I I tell the story through hikes um, and it's where I read a lot of my dense reads, you know, and, I you know, I'll read Nietzsche um, out in the bush And um, now, as it happens quite perfectly, walking in nature then turns out to be my fix, my salve, my through line, my my way forward. And I happen upon that quite accidentally. It's almost like it was right in front of me. And I go, oh, God, there we go. I've got the solution. I've been doing it all along. Um, And then there's also a legacy to walking in nature as a way to solve complex problems. So some of the greatest philosophers and political thinkers, um, poets and scientists have hiked to get clear. So Nietzsche... He, he wrote everything um, walking out in nature. Hegel, I think it was, had a pen inserted into his walking stick and sort of paper, a little sort of insert that he could put paper in and he'd stop and write as he went. Virginia Woolf, Charles Darwin, um, Winston Churchill, uh, Bill Gates, Mark Zuckerberg, they all walk to come up with their incredible inventions and contributions. So I sort of feel that we can, we need to walk out our reconnection with life. We need to walk out uh, our path forward to saving the planet. Um, so it, it, I was so happy when I realised that I was already doing the fix that I'd been looking for, you know. There's a point a third of the way through the book, you might recall, where I'm like, holy shit, I don't have an answer. I've promised my publishers in the US, UK and Australia that I've got a path forward through all of this, right? I thought I had it and then I got into it and realised, oh, my goodness, what am I going to do? Um, and it, I went for a hike to try to work out what I was going to do. I was so overwhelmed. I had a coffee with my meditation teacher and he gave me some great advice. He said, Sarah, you need to show us how to do this because, and you need to make it it look charming, more charming than the status quo, more charming than the way we're doing things. He said, because I know you enjoy it. You don't do it because it's like self-flagellation because I live as a minimalist. I lived out of one bag for 10 years. I ride a bike everywhere. I do zero food waste, all of that stuff. And it sounds very pious, but I do it because I love it. And he said, show us how to do it. Show us the joy. So I went for a hike to work it out and I was running really hard in the bush. I just threw myself at bushland and just sort of ran and scrambled over rocks and so on. And um, and I stopped at one point and I looked at this murmuration of birds and I saw how just perfectly formed it was with no effort. And I realised the solution was nature. Every answer we ever need is emulated 
in the natural world. We can turn to nature. We can just be in it. So, yeah, that's that's how the hiking thing came about. Mm, yeah, I love that. I love that. Um, but yes, I other... just wanted to inspire people to get out there. And, yeah. and as a founder of Cosmo, I knew that I needed to make this kind of sexy. I needed to make it sort of, I needed a layer of, I don't know, colour, you know, uh, hot pink with sequins. And um, hiking had become really popular in the last couple of years. It's, it's become the thing to do. Um, Getty Images, the number one image that was used on Getty Images when I was the editor of Cosmo, was a shot, and you'll probably recognise it, or at least something similar, of a girl wearing white bra and undies set, sort of lying on a bed of white sheets with dappled lighting. And you'd use that shot to sort of, you know, illustrate how to get the corner office and, you know, premenstrual pain, right? And the most popular Getty image 10 years later, so this was in 2017, um, was a picture of a girl wearing a beanie and a backpack and a puffer vest out hiking above Lake Louise in, in Banff um, and telling, right, you know, a totally different yeah. idea of what realised femininity is. So, um, or at least what appeals to women. So, yeah, it, hiking became a way of making it all a little bit sexy and for people who are stuck in lockdown, it, it, you know, they can maybe live vicariously through my hikes around the world. Mm-hmm. It's quite a good sign if that image is what we're aspiring to. I think that's a good, a good sign of things to, to come, hopefully. Yeah. 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 Um, I wanted to ask, are there other things that you do to stay mentally healthy? Mm. Yeah, there's quite a few that I've had to put in place. I call them sort of certainty anchors that um, keep me balanced. Um, and modulated so that my anxiety can be used as a superpower, not as something that holds me back. So I exercise every day. I, I don't take it seriously as in I have apps or Fitbits or, you know, um, a set agenda. I wake up and I just move. And so some days, if it, and it depends on the weather and it depends on how well I've slept. <laughs> so some days it's gentle yoga in my study um, for half an hour. Sometimes it's a sand run or an ocean swim. Um, sometimes it's a Pilates class. So yeah, I move every day. Exercise really is a bit of a silver bullet for me. It, it, I can't, I actually can't function without it mentally. Mm. Um, the second thing is meditation. So after exercise, I meditate. And again, if I get too rigid with it, it doesn't, it, it turns into a chore. I don't, I do, I really do try to find things. I try to find the, the juicy, enjoyable aspect of things. So sometimes I meditate for five minutes. I try to make it 20 minutes. Um, and sometimes I just vigilance work. So I go, right, it's 20 minutes. I set a timer and I'll stick to it. Um, but I do meditate at least once a day, sometimes twice a day. Um, I, I, I eat a, an abundance of good food rather than try to restrict the bad, so-called bad food. So I, um, I eat a lot of vegetables um, and a lot of good fat. And I just don't hold back. If it's good fat and, and got lots of nutrients, I eat as much as I need to. And I'll eat until I'm super full. Um, I tend to eat two or three times a day. I find that works well for me. Um, I need to feel nourished and and so on. And then I also need to get my body to reset. That's what works for me. Um, I also have been on a bit of a um, mission to, especially since COVID's been happening and the world has shifted so much, I've decided to, I have to get very serious about what I'm going to do with the remaining years on this planet. And um, I don't have time for redundancies or things that hold me back. And so I've had to get fairly vigilant. You know, it's only, you know, it's early 2021, but I, I'm having to remove aspects to my life business partners that I just don't just don't serve a greater purpose um and I'm having to get quite full on about it you know quite focused on that so that's made a big difference to my life mm. um, 
it's it's I've had to do that throughout my life. So I, as you know, I got rid of the I Quit Sugar business. I shut it down and gave all of the money to charity. And I continue to give about 78% of my money, my income to charity. And that was a big decision that I made because it enabled me to move forward with more meaningful stuff. While ever I was managing the, the business and the financials and all of that, I was going to be held back. So I... I make these decisions quite regularly. I have an appointment with myself, you know, that sort of meaningful relationship, that discerning discussion with myself to go, right, get real, Sarah, what matters? Okay, now what's getting in the way of you doing what matters? So, yeah, there's some of the practices, I suppose. They sound a bit of but... That's amazing. That's really inspiring, actually, the idea of thinking about what really matters in your life, getting rid of the things that, you know, aren't meaningful the relationships the the business aspects i'll tell you one other thing that helps that's a little maybe a little bit more tangible for people listening is and i have a chapter on it in the book called soul nerding so i soul nerd and soul nerding is basically reading up and studying the mindsets the work the the practices the the life hacks of people who have lived meaningful lives so i'm talking philosophers writers Whatever, whoever it might be. And so throughout the book, I actually share a lot of those nerds, those soul nerds whose work I, I study. And that in itself, the process of applying myself to their experience gets me into that nice, discerning, mindful relationship with myself. But um, it because it's a practice, you know, um, you have to not be distracted. And then the second thing is it reminds me that I'm not alone. It is actually really appropriate and normal to be having the thoughts I've been having. And it's just such a comfort to know that these people, these people that have gone on to do these grand, beautiful things, went through the hard slog of setting up these, you know, once again, these uh, moral guardrails, um, having various torturous at times practices to keep them on the straight and narrow, but even just reading about their pain, just knowing that other people go through pain and they have to work their ways through it and then seeing great things generally come out of that work. Mm. So that's what I call soul nerding and soul nerding. Oh, it's a joyous thing, you know? And again, it's one of those practices that we've lost touch with. We don't do long reads. Most people can't even read a proper philosophical book anymore. You know, our brains have been rewired. So it's a practice Mm. like meditation. Yeah. Yeah. Is there anything that you've been anything specific that you've been reading recently that you could share about? Yeah, Virginia Woolf. I reread um, A Room of One's Own. Oh my God, it's so radical and cool. And she's just like, she gets quite vigilant with what matters to her and she speaks out. And this is a time for speaking out. Um, let me see. Um, I've just interviewed. Sia, the singer, um, who's written over 100 hits for Beyonce and she wrote Diamonds for Rihanna and Chandelier and so on. She's an Australian and I've been following her work for a very long time, but I've got a podcast and I just interviewed her this morning actually, so I've been soul nerding on her work and her thinking and her philosophies and her the, the life that she's led. And I've been in tears and I've gone into a rabbit hole, I see a rabbit hole. Um, so yeah, that's her work. Um, the Stoics, I've been reading a bit of Stoic, the Stoics, um, Seneca and so on. I find great comfort there. Um, other, Rutger Bregman is another person I interviewed for my podcast. He wrote Humankind. He writes about, he breaks down a lot of the science that says we're selfish beings and that we're, um, we're sort of the Lord of the Flies types where we will analyze each other to get ahead and he breaks down a lot of the thinking there um and Nietzsche thus spoke Zarathustra I've just reread as well it's not easy going but there's some beautiful moments in it okay, yeah awesome definitely adding some things to my reading list I'm gonna <laughs> take myself out into into a rice paddy and read some Nietzsche <laughs> um, yeah yeah just what I suppose one final question I wanted to come back I think we, we sort of touched on this the kind of the climate change issue um I think reading your book has definitely I mean I'm, I'm involved in that world to some extent in Extinction Rebellion 
but I think reading your book has kind of lit more of a fire under my butt. Um, are there things that you when you when you talk about kind of people being active in this area what are some of the things that you would recommend if someone's thinking actually you know I've read this book and actually it has reminded me how important this is I'm ready to face it head on rather than burying burying it what what advice would you have for people I'll, I'll, ref, I'll refer to phrases in my book um there's one that um I think resonates with people and I applied it to myself as well when I was writing the book is start where you are I think a lot of people feel that they've got to somehow start up some new climate group and you know um you know do something massive you know and because like massive problem therefore I've got to do something massive and then they'll get overwhelmed and do nothing that's the upshot in fact the most impactful believable hashtag authentic way to go about it is to actually start where you are and that will be often very ordinary and small. And so as an example that I use in the book to sort of illustrate it, there's a friend of mine called Lucy and she's got two little boys that they're, they're rat bags and they live up the road and she's frustrated. She, she feels that she needs to be doing more um, in life in general, but particularly around climate. And during the strikes late 2019, so you remember the school's strike for climate that were global, um, she was like frustrated because the parents at the school that her boys were at were not mobilizing. So she said, what can I do, Sarah? And I said, well, what idea do you have? She said, well, I was thinking if I just went and hired a minibus, then people might go to it because they're sort of saying it's a bit too hard to get into the city. And I said, that sounds awesome. So she put it up on one of those apps where you can book in like an event and pay the money and you know secure your spot so she did that and um it booked out in an hour or something and then she upgraded it to a coach and then she upgraded it to two coaches so in 48 hours she managed to get 150 extra parents and kids to to the strike i shared that story on my instagram and then i would say half a dozen people quickly mobilized and did exactly the same thing so lucy's ordinary action where she started where she was which was as a frustrated mum with limited resources um got probably 500 people that's a conservative estimation to a really important strike and of course 500 people then share the message they're enrolled and they share the message with neighbours and it probably had an impact of several thousand. So that is how change happens. And I actually show the, the, the arithmetic behind it and the science behind how that actually works. So um, start where you are is one thing. At a tangible level, it literally does mean where you see an opportunity, go there. Don't hesitate, just do it. Be engaged because action begets action. It actually doesn't really matter what you do if you do something, it will lead somewhere. And at the very least, it will make you feel empowered. And at the very least, it will also make you get involved in some of the theory and the, the news and the science. And so you feel a lot more empowered as well. Um, I think that there's tangible things. Um, I would say just walk your message as much as possible. So no, no plastic bottles. No, um, no takeaway coffee cups, single use. Um, and uh, yeah, so, so do that. And that's really important. It really is. I, and I talk about why it is. A lot of people go, it's not gonna make any difference. Well, it does. It absolutely does for a bunch of nuanced reasons. Um, have a look at your electricity provider and research how you can actually switch. Have a look at your bank and switch. They're the, probably two of the most powerful things a consumer can do. The other most powerful thing, there's a book called Project Drawdown that actually um, assesses 100 of the actions you can take and tells you which actually reduces the most amount of carbon dioxide, which is what we're wanting to do. That's the, most, that's the biggest aim here is to reduce carbon dioxide. So, um, and the, the, one of the top three things you can do is um, to reduce your food waste. And it sounds ridiculous, but if you, we, I think Brits and Australians are much the same. We throw out about 30 to 40% of our food. Now, if we halved that, firstly, it would produce enough food for the entire world. There is enough food on this planet to feed the entire world. If Westerners just halve the amount of food they waste, so that's something, I might even just leave it at that. Everyone, mm. you know, 
talk about vegan versus meat eating, um, you know, how often you catch a plane, you can talk about all of that. And it's quite hard because, you know, we have limitations and so on. But absolutely, if you can cut food waste, you're doing something really tangible. Okay, that's so, so uh, yeah, powerful. And um, it's so easy as well to switch banks these days, a lot of the banks, the ethical banks are just online banks. And it's literally, it takes about two minutes to download the app yeah. and they switch it all over and switch all your direct debit stuff. It's like super easy. Same with yeah. swapping, um, changing your electricity. They kind of sort it all out. So definitely recommend people do those things as well. Um, thank you so much, Sarah. This has been so fascinating to speak to you. Oh. Thank you so much for all the work you're doing in the world. You're a big inspiration to me. Um, where can people find out more about you and get your book and uh anything else that you're up to okay um well sarahwilson.com is where everything is kind of hosted and and information on my podcast that's coming up and but also the books are there and in fact i have a big rundown of where you can buy the book on at, at discount <laughs> so every time a bookstore somewhere in the world offers a discount on my book i you know, upload, um, load it. So uh, if you go to sarahwilson.com, that's all there. Um, for anyone who's wanting to really um, cut food waste, um, I've got two cookbooks and um, Simplicious Flow was the fir world's first zero food waste cookbook in a sense that the making of it was also zero food waste and it's like 348 recipes and lots of hacks. So you can find out information about that too if you're interested. It's available as a digital book worldwide. Um, and you can find all of that on my website. And on Instagram, I'm sort of Sarah Wilson with two, with a, what is it called? Like two little feet either side. If you write Sarah oh, Wilson in, yeah. it'll come up. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Amazing. Thank you so much. My absolute pleasure. Um, good luck reading Nietzsche in a, a rice paddy soon, Chloe. <laughs>